Good to see everybody today. And as you're finding your seat, you can be finding your place in the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 11. That's where we're going to be at this morning. And, and we're going to pick things up where we left off last Sunday. We had been away from Acts for a few weeks and got back into it. Last week, we covered the first 18 verses uh, last Sunday, and we're going to look at verses 19 through 30 uh, through the end of the chapter uh, uh, this morning. And, and this morning, it's, it's, um, you'll see from the passage, it's, it's going to take us a little bit of time to get into it. We're going to, I, I, I'm going to have to lay some groundwork, and I'm going to do a recap of kind of everything because of the nature of, of the passage and the transitional aspect of it, but I'll, I'll explain all that. But, but in the verses uh, that we're going to study this morning, I want to talk to you about the work of building upon a foundation, the work of building upon a, a foundation, because as most of you are aware of, at least if you've been coming through this study uh, for very long at all, you know, you've heard me say by now that Acts is a transition book. It's one of the three primary transition books in the Bible. We have the book of Matthew that transitions us from the Old Testament into the, into the Gospels, into the New Testament, and into the life of Jesus. And then we have the book of Acts that transitions us out of the Gospels and out of the life of Jesus and into the church age and the body of Christ. And then we have the book of Hebrews. It's also a transition book, trans, transitions us out of the church age and then into what's to come after that, the tribulation and beyond. And so Acts is a transition book, and, and we are in the, the, the primary transition section of this transition book. And, and what I mean by that is that primarily the first seven chapters of the book of Acts was Jewish focus. It was led by the apostles, namely Peter. They were looking for the kingdom return of Jesus, and they were preaching a kingdom gospel. And then when we get to Acts chapter 13 here in just a, a few weeks, and then through the remainder of the books, those chapters are primarily Gentile focus, led by Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, and it's a kingdom of God focus, and it's a different gospel of grace and all that sort of thing. But, but chapters 8 through 12 is where we see much of that transition occur. Now, now there are transitional aspects throughout the entire book. That's why it's a transition book. But these middle chapters here are really the transition within the transition because starting in chapter 8, there were some obvious changes from what we saw in the first seven chapters. And we saw pri primarily the gospel begin to go out, right? And so the gospel went to Samaria for the first time in accordance with Jesus' command in Acts 1-8 to go, you know, the, to be to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost and and so we see it begin to go out, and then the beginning of chapter 9, Saul of Tarsus gets saved, setting the stage for the gospel to eventually fully go to the Gentiles because he is the leader of that effort. And then chapter 9, it ended with, with a kind of a final message to Israel through Peter. So Peter came back on the stage, and he healed a, a man who was laying with palsy named Aeneas, and then he, he rose a lady from the dead named Tabitha, and we looked at, at that, those miracles in some doctrinal detail and how they were messages to Israel that even though God was moving away, for them, away from them for the time being, that he would get back to them and ultimately save them and that he would fulfill Romans chapter 11, verses 25 through 27. And again, I'm, I'm doing all of this recap for a reason, so just stay with me here. Don't, don't, don't lose focus in the introduction here. We got we to work through some stuff. But but Romans 11, verses 25 through 27, are some key verses uh, in our Bible, especially with respect to the transitional, transitional aspect of the book of Acts. And there Paul says, For I would not, brethren, that, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As is written, there shall come out of Sion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. And, and that's going to happen. That will happen again at the second coming of Christ after the tribulation period. And so Peter, through those miracles, God sends that message to them. that He, he hasn't given up on them yet. And then we get to Acts chapter 10, and, and we see another major event with the salvation of a Gentile, an Italian man named Cornelius, through the preaching of Peter, 
who was the apostle to the Jews. And that was to signify to the Jews that God was opening a new door. And the things were changing, including the gospel, because Cornelius and his friends and family were saved in the same way that you and I are saved today. And that was different than what Peter preached through those first seven chapters. It was different than his salvation message in Acts 2.38 that says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That, that was not the message to Cornelius in chapter 10. And not because Peter even knew that there was a new message to deliver, but because the Holy Spirit stopped him. And we talked about that, you know, again in some detail when, when we studied that scripture. And then last week we started chapter 11, and, and, and word gets back to Jerusalem of what had happened uh, with Cornelius, and, and, and Peter comes back to defend his actions, and he explains to the rest of the apostles, the Jewish believers, how, how what had happened to him and what had happened to Cornelius and, and what God did. And while it was still obviously a confusing time, and we'll see when we get into Acts chapter 15, you know, they're still confused. For the time being, you know, they accept it. Now, again, they're going to go back on that. We'll, we'll look at all that. But, but for the time being, they accepted it to the point that they rejoiced in what God was doing. And we ended last week with Acts eleven eighteen that says, And when they, those apostles and believers that were back in Jerusalem, when they heard these things, what had happened to Cornelius, they held their peace. They, you know, they, they kind of calmed down a little bit and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. And everyone began to acknowledge that something new was in the works. And it was an exciting time. But when we get to verse 19, the scene shifts. There's, there's a shift in the narrative. Look there, Acts eleven nineteen. 19, it says, Now when they were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen, traveled as far as Phinehas and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And so we have a bit of a shift in the narrative. So we, we, we've kind of seen these major events, these major things that were going on. And Philip goes into Samaria, and then he wins this Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord. And then Saul gets saved, and then Peter performs these miracles. Then Cornelius, all these boom, 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 boom. And when we get to Acts eleven nineteen, we shift back to where we were at the beginning of Acts chapter 8. Because Acts chapter 8, 4 says... Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So we shift back. We, so, so Acts 8.5 through Acts 11.18 is sort of this big parenthetical, big parentheses uh, in the narrative of the book of Acts. And so we shift back to where at the end of 7, Stephen is stoned. Saul is there. He's consenting unto his death. And he starts to persecute the church you know, in, in, in grand fashion. And so that scatters all the believers because, you know, they don't want to end up the way Stephen ended up. And so we go from Acts 8-4 to Acts 11-19, so we're back to that narrative of, of what is going on. And the believers are being scattered because of the persecution they're facing. And what we begin to see now is, is all of that parenthetical set the stage for where God's going. So he had to lay all that groundwork to show us where he's going with his mission and how he's changing things. Because in Acts eleven nineteen, 19, we begin to see the places that the people landed. And one of those places is a city named Antioch. And Antioch is, begin, is going to become the major city from which the church launches out to reach the uttermost. The Gentile world, the, the final fulfillment of Acts 1-8. Antioch is going to be the center. So just as Jerusalem was the primary focus in the first half of this book, Antioch will become the primary city of focus in the second half of this book. And we're introduced to it in Acts chapter 11. Now, it's not the first mention. The first mention was in Acts chapter 6, actually, when they were naming those deacons. And, and we saw the first mention there, but, but really... We don't know anything about Antioch until here, Acts chapter 11. And Antioch was a very pagan city. It was, it was very hedonistic, in fact. Um, in northern Syria, it was, a, it was a significant city. It was the third largest city in, in the known world, at least of the Roman Empire at that time. You had Rome, you had Alexandria. 
And then you had Antioch. Antioch is in what is, you know, northern Syria today. It was, it's known as Antioch of Syria, and it's known that way because there are, there are multiple Antiochs. At that time in, in, in civilization, there were about 16 cities named Antioch, and actually a few of them are mentioned in the Bible. And so, so this is, is set out as Antioch of Syria. And it's in the midst of this large pagan hedonistic city, this vile city, that a Gentile church takes root and blossoms. And this gets us to really the focus of where we're going today regarding building upon a foundation. Because Christianity, as we know it today, starting really with this church in Antioch, was built off the foundation of the work of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus was the cornerstone, and the apostles and the prophets laid the foundation. That's what Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. He said, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God. That's one of the names of, of the church. So he's speaking of the church. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And so the work of Christ sets the stage for something very new. And, and the apostles and, and all the work of the prophets that have built up to that laid the foundation for even what we are doing right here this morning. It's a pretty amazing thing. And we've seen much of that foundation built in the first 10 chapters of Acts. So, you know, you, there's certain pockets that we saw everything that even the model for what we do today being established. Primarily Acts chapter 2, they established doctrine. Now that doctrine was a little different then than it is today, but they established doctrine, they established fellowship, they established ministry. All of what we do is based on the model and the foundation that the apostles laid. But, but God was now moving beyond Israel. And the foundational work of those Jewish apostles was coming to an end. And the work was changing. And something new was being built upon the foundation that had been laid. And this is what we are beginning to see in Antioch, here in Acts chapter 11. And in our text this morning, we just see a great picture of the key ingredients needed to build upon any foundation. And this applies even for us today, for First Baptist Church in 2024. The ingredients we're going to talk about today are what we need moving forward this year, if, if this year is going to be a year of growth, as I've been talking about since January. Right? We have a, a strong foundation, 165 years this church has been here and stood strong and stood on God's word with men proclaiming the truth. But, but we always need to be continuing to grow. We can't be satisfied on, on that. We need to continue to grow. We need to continue to build. We need to continue to develop. And there's some key areas that we always need to be building and developing and growing in. And that's the key ingredients that we're going to look at this morning. And there's nothing new in them, as, as you're going to see. Again, very simple, very practical message. There's nothing new in them. But we do have to know that we'll never build beyond where we are today if we don't continue to get these ingredients right. And we're at risk for them slipping at any point, personally and as a church. So we need to continue to remind ourselves of what God's doing and why he's doing it and how we're to be a part of it. So let's read our passage uh, of study this morning and then pull out these ingredients of growth and, and building that, that we see with this budding church in Antioch, Acts chapter 11, starting in verse 19. The Bible says, Now, they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phenice and Cyprus, and Antioch preaching the word none, word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas. He should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. 
and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem and Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that, that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. All right, so let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him uh, to teach us uh, what we need personally this morning and, and reveal to us his plan uh, to continue to build and grow this church. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for the time that we have together. Thank you for uh, the believers that we got to see submit to baptism this morning and just the beautiful picture that is of, of their identification with your death, burial, and resurrection as they commit to, to die to themselves and to, to, to rise in newness of life, to walk after you and your ways. And that's what we see this morning in, in our passage. And so, Lord, I just pray that you continue to work in us individually on what it is we need to work on, and you would can do this, the work that only your Spirit can do to convince and convict us of our sin and, and lead us to repentance, Lord, so we can move forward in, in, in your path for our life. And, and Lord, I just pray that you're glorified in all of it, that everything said is true to your word, that you've moved me out of the way, and Lord, that your Spirit speaks clearly and authoritatively through your word. Uh, for our benefit. And we just thank you for it uh, before we even do it. And we just ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now again, with, just with respect to the narrative, you know, we, we, as you saw, we reverted back to kind of where we were at Acts chapter 8. And then we're, you know, we're moving forward. And at that point, the persecution ramped up. The Jewish believers in Jerusalem and Judea were dispersed and scattered to avoid the same outcome that Stephen faced. So they went into Samaria and beyond. And in Acts eleven nineteen, we see where that beyond started. And it, and it started in a place called Phoenicia. And I think we have a map here. And so that, that's right down here. It's Phoenicia uh, right here, okay? And so you have Jerusalem down here. You have kind of what's known as Israel. Joppa, you know, is where, um, uh, where Peter was before he went up to Caesarea for Cornelius. And so, you know, this work is going on down here. And so they scatter, right? They start moving. And they move up to this place uh, called, called Phoenice or, or Phoenicia. And it's right there on the coastal plain of Palestine along the Mediterranean Sea. And there are two famous cities there, Tyre and Sidon. You see those in the, in, in the Bible a lot. And so those are two famous cities. And so, so people would move up to Phoenice and, and Tyre and Sidon. And, 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 and in those port cities of Sidon and Tyre, you could catch a boat and you could go over here to Cyprus. Right? So you, they, many people did that. They caught a boat, and they found their way to the island of Cyprus. But others didn't go west. They just kept going north, up here to Antioch. So Antioch of Syria. Right? And so this was sort of the pattern. Right? People were moving north. They were moving out into the Mediterranean Sea to the island of Cyprus. So that's the Great Sea. You see there, it's the Mediterranean Sea. And, and Antioch was the capital of Syria. Again, a very strategic location. But I want you to notice that when they landed in, in all these places in Acts eleven nineteen, 19, it says that, that they were preaching to the Jews only, right? And that's one of the ways we know that Acts 8, 5 through Acts, you know, eleven eighteen 18 is a parenthesis because what we see in there is very little preaching to the Jews, right? But the people are being scattered and they're preaching to the Jews only. Well, why, would, why were they doing that? It seems like things have changed. Well, they didn't know that yet. These were Jewish believers that, that were coming out of, out of Jerusalem and out of Judea. And they still believed that salvation was for the Jews. Word hadn't spread yet of what happened with Cornelius. And, and it was happening all at the same time. Again, just think of that time as a parenthesis. So it's all happening at the same time. But... As the gospel was being spread, as these Jewish believers were sharing the message of Peter, it didn't just stay with the Jewish believers because they weren't in Jerusalem anymore. They weren't in Judea anymore. And in verse 20, we see that there were some from Cyprus, the island, and then Cyrene, which we don't have on the map, but that's in eastern Libya in northern Africa. There were some from Cyprus and Cyrene who were witnessing to this group of Grecians. 
And the word Grecian just means Greek speaking or related to Greek culture in some way. And so other times in the book of Acts, the Grecians referred to Jews who were Greek speaking and who lived outside of Israel. But it's clear from the context here that these Grecians were Gentiles. And I don't have time to explain all of that to you, but know that that is consistent with other places of Scripture. So, for example, Joel 3.6 says, The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have you sold unto the Grecians, that you might remove them far from their border. And again, we're not going to take the time to go through it, but if you read the full context of that passage from verse 1 through verse 9, it's very clear that those Grecians are Gentiles. And, and these were Gentile Grecians then in Antioch. And verse 21 is probably the key verse in this passage, Acts eleven twenty one. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned to the Lord. And that great number would have mostly been Gentiles. And a new, diverse, Gentile, primarily Gentile church is born. They were the Grecians. And so the Jewish home church back in Jerusalem, they hear about it and they want to know what's going on. So they make sure that everything is on the up and up. And so they send Barnabas to check it out. Again, this is another way we, we know that these Grecians were Gentiles because it's the very same thing they did in Acts chapter 8 when they heard what was going on in Samaria. All right, they sent Peter and John to go check it out and to confirm the work. So all this was kind of happening simultaneously. But not only... They, I mean, they only did that when things were going on outside of Jerusalem and Judea, outside of, you know, traditionally Jewish believers. And so they do it here, but this time they don't even send a Jewish apostle. They don't even send a native Jew. They send Barnabas, who is from Cyprus, according to Acts 4.36. And they sent him because this was something new, and this was something different. And it was Gentile in focus. And so Barnabas arrives and he confirms the work, and he confirms the church that was being established, and he's encouraged, and he challenges them and exhorts them. But what happens here is something very different than what happened in Samaria. Because Barnabas doesn't go back to Jerusalem. See, in Acts chapter 8, Peter and John come to confirm and to lay hands on those in Samaria. And they do their work, and then they go back. And, and that's not what happened here. Instead... Barnabas goes and finds Saul. They come back together and stay for a year to teach this, the people of this new church and build a church upon the foundation that had started back in Jerusalem some seven years earlier. And what we're going to see in the coming chapters is that the church in Antioch, again, in a city filled with pagan hedonism, becomes the model church for us today. And it's taken us a while to get there. I know, I told you. I, ho I hope you stuck with me because that was important just to work through to, so you understand what's going on. But it was all made possible because of the key ingredients that we see in this church from its inception. And again, these are the same ingredients we need in First, Chap First Baptist Church today. And it starts with the right people. It starts with the right people. And there are multiple people in this account that give us the many different characteristics of the type of people we need in the church. And it starts even before Barnabas arrives. Look back at verses 20 and 21 again. It says, And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, again, the Gentiles, preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. And these were the founders of this church, or at least part of them. And I, and I want you to just think about this, this second, because think about this for a second, because this becomes the model church for, all, for everything that we're even still doing today. And, and we'll see that as we get into Acts chapter 13 and, and beyond. And the founders of it, we don't even know their names, right? We know Barnabas. And we know Saul, the, the, we know their names. But these guys, we don't know their names. Their names are never given. And I don't believe anything in the Bible is a coincidence. And I think God didn't give us their names because I think they didn't care about their own names. And, and they obviously didn't have anything to do with 
or likely have anything to do with the writing of the book of Acts. Luke is the author. But I don't want you to miss the picture in that. Because I think these people were more preoccupied with people finding out about the name of Jesus Christ than their own names anyway. And, and from a picture standpoint, that is the type of people we all need to be. The type of faceless commitment to people and ministering to people the Lord Jesus. That's what every church needs. And, and I put this next statement on your outline sheet is, is, is because if, if, if you are interested in making sure everyone knows your name, then you have the wrong approach to ministry. Because we are to do what we do for one person only. And I promise you that person knows your name. The Bible talks about it over and over. And he knows what you're doing, and he's keeping record. Or, or what you're not doing. But listen, this isn't easy. We're all human. We're all flesh. And every single one of us, we, it's in our nature we like to be recognized. And it can hurt a little bit if you think you're giving and giving and giving and no one is noticing. But listen, all I can say is in those times, rejoice that you get to be like Christ. Because that was his testimony. John 1.11 says he came unto his own and his own received him not. So Jesus knows the feeling of feeling left out. And he didn't let that trip him up. He kept on task. And, and that's the picture that we see in these unnamed founders of the Antioch church. They just preached. They just preached the Lord Jesus. And they preached him as Savior. And they preached him as Lord. And because of that, verse 21 says, the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned to the Lord. And, and, and what is what's interesting is, 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 again, we're seeing the transitional nature of what's going on. And when you get to Antioch and when you get to the Gentile church, numbers don't matter. With Jews, it did. And, and, and you see that, we don't have time to look at this, but you see that throughout the Old Testament and numbering and all sorts of things. And all through the early, we saw 3,000 were added to the church, 5,000 were added to the church. We see the numbers. But once we get here, there's a spiritual focus and things are changing. And now it's just a great number because the number, it's great that it's a, bit, a lot of people, but the number of who it is, it doesn't matter because we have a, a different focus now. And a great number turned unto the Lord, and what a great testimony that is. And these guys had the hand of the Lord with them, and the, the hand of the Lord, we don't have time for it, but it's a very interesting study. I will just say it has to do with the power of God, and, and it has to do with his power either blessing or cursing or providing judgment. In fact, the first mention of the phrase, hand of the Lord, is found in Exodus 9-3 during the plagues that God was pouring out on Egypt. That was cursings came at the hand of the Lord, and they showed his power. But at the end of the day, whether it has a positive connotation or a negative connotation, it's related to just the work of God. It's his hands that do the work. You see this, for example, in Nehemiah 2, verse 18, that says, Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthen their hands for this good work. And this is important for us to consider because the work that we do in and through this church can either come through our own hands or through the hands of the Lord. And I, I think you know which direction that needs to be flowing. And it's not that our hands aren't involved. That's even what Nehemiah says. You know, they strengthen their hands for this good work. It's not that our hands aren't involved. We're the ones doing the work, but we need his hands to lead our hands. It's a message of Psalm 90, verse 17. It says, and let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish thou the work of our hands. We need his beauty, his grace, his guidance to establish the work of our hands. Yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. Because if we do that work ourselves. We're going to end up doing work that's nothing of God. We need his hands to lead our hands. 
And that's what we see happening in Antioch. And so we see the founders who were building off of the foundation of what they had been taught. And then next we see Barnabas come on the scene. And he comes in and he takes things to the next level. And that's just how the church works. There's different people for different things and different giftings. And it all works together for the good of the body. And so we need people in the church like Barnabas. And with Barnabas, we see multiple things. But it starts with, we see a man who has some spiritual discernment. Because he's able to come into the city and quickly assess the validity of what's going on. Look at verse 22. Then tidings of these things came under the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they should cleave unto the Lord. So Barnabas was able to see the grace of God that was on them through the hand of God. And that takes some discernment. And that unfortunately is a problem in churches today is we don't have enough people with spiritual discernment to see what it is that, that's going on. And there's gifting associated with discernment, according to 1 Corinthians 12.10, but there's a certain level of discernment that we can all attain. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verses 4 or 5 says that where the word of a king is, there's power. And who may say unto him, What doest thou? Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing, and a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. And that's a, I mean, this is a key verse with respect to discernment because, because, because most people, they just think, okay, can you assess a situation and then act upon the situation? Well, okay, yeah, that, that's certainly absolutely a part of it. There's judgment involved. But the, the part that most people miss is there's also a time element involved. We live in time and space. And so we can discern a situation, but is, is, is right now the time to act upon it? Well, that, that takes discernment. And, and most people miss that, right? Because as, as a culture, we don't have patience. We want something acted upon now, whatever. We want justice now, whatever it might be. Uh, okay, but th that's not following what the Bible has to say. Because we have to discern both time and judgment. And if you're wise, you can discern that. And how do you get that wisdom? You get that wisdom and power from the king's word. But as we talk about all the time, you've got to be able to spend time in that king's word to be able to get that wisdom. And so Hebrews 5.14 says, But strong meat belonging to them that are of full age, who are spiritually mature, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Right? And so that's what spiritual maturity brings. It, it, the, the time in God's word allows us to then discern situations and good and evil and understanding the time, understanding what the judgment needs to be. So knowing the word of God leads you to be able to discern, but then it's practically applied in your life only as you walk in the spirit. That's 1 Corinthians 2 verses 13 and 14. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned, right? It's a spiritual level of discernment. And so we can see things on the surface, but the natural man, if you don't have the spirit of God in you, you can't take what the word of God says and then see beyond the surface. But as you have the spirit of God in you and as you walk in the spirit, then you can. So this means we all can receive a certain level of discernment from the Holy Spirit as we spend time in God's word, that's it. It's Christian Living 101. But listen, those are the people we need. Those that are nailing Christian Living 101. Unfortunately, it's not near as big a group as it should be. But, but those that are, that are spending time in God's word and walking according to his spirit, they understand some things. And Barnabas was one of them. But with Barnabas, not only... Does he have discernment? We also see that he was a man of great character. Look at verse 24. Speaking of Barnabas, it says, For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people, again, no specific number, but much people was added unto the Lord. 
We see three characteristics there that, that make up Barnabas' character. It says he was a good man in his actions. That speaks to, of his testimony to others. And listen, a, a good man can be hard to find. I know all the ladies are saying amen, but I mean that, I mean that biblically. Because according to Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. And that does not describe just anybody. And it's somebody who is willing to follow the Lord, who's willing to have his steps ordered by the Lord. And someone that delighteth in his way and not our own way. So he was a good man. He had a, a good testimony to others. And then second, Barnabas was full of the Holy Ghost. And that speaks of his testimony to God. But he was honest. He was true to the Lord. And then third, he was full of faith. And that speaks to his testimony to himself. So he was, there's an inward testimony. There's an upward testimony. There's an outward testimony. Because we all need to know that we really do believe God and that we really have faith in him. And that'll, that will be tested for, for all of us at some point in our life, from, you know, multiple times in our life for most of us. And the truth is we're no good to God if we don't believe him. You know, we, we can talk a good talk, but when the rubber meets the road of our faith and we face the trials of life and we face the hard times, how do we respond? Well, you know, that's, that's the question. And ultimately, if we don't respond in faith, if we don't respond in belief to what God's word says, and even if we don't like it, even if we don't even personally like say, I don't think that's right, if we still, as long as we're willing to believe it and follow it, okay, well, then you're of use to God. But at the point you quit doing that, you're no good to him. And Barnabas believed him. He was a man of faith. And he was willing to do whatsoever was needed for the good of the church. And so that brings us to, to the next quality that we see in Barnabas. That he was willing to work in a team setting. For Barnabas, it meant he cared so much about the church that he was willing to work with others. And he did not have to be the man himself. He didn't need the limelight because he knew that the work was bigger than just himself, and he knew ultimately that God had given a word to Saul that he hadn't given to himself. And, you know, and, and, and that's what a, a lot of times people you know, don't understand in, in the context of a church. So we all see things you know, from our own perspective, and, and that's great, we should, and, and, and we should work on that. We should all talk through it. This is a, this is a body, we're a family, and, and, and all of those things, the good things and the bad things. But what we have to understand is like, you know, when, so certain times decisions will be made for the church or whatever that, that people don't agree with. And so, and, and, and we don't always make the right decisions. Lord knows, I, I wish we did, but we certainly don't. I mean, that's, we're human, we're flawed, you know, and, 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 and we, we work the best we can. But, the thing that people don't understand sometimes is that, you know, God may speak to me and maybe the other pastors about First Baptist Church and our ministries in different ways than he speaks to you because, because we're in charge. And it's not that we're better. Of course not. It's just that the, the, the structure and the role that God set up and so many people see things, it's like, oh, man, this would be, this would be great. Okay, but until God tells us that, you know, then then. then we got to work in a, in, a, in, the, in a different environment. And so what Saul was, or what Barnabas was able to see is that God had revealed some things to Saul. Again, it's part of the reason why that par parenthetical in, in Acts 8, 5 through eleven eighteen 18 needed to be there. Part of that was Saul being saved, going off to Arabia. And we talked about all that. There was that three-year span where he was in Damascus and Arabia. God was doing a work, and God was revealing to him, actually, the mystery of the New Testament that Paul writes. And Barnabas was aware, and he knew that there was a new thing going on, a new church that was going to be Gentile-focused. And he's like, I can't do this on my own, because God told Paul some things that this church needs to know. And so it, it, the work was bigger than just himself, and so he went and found the help. Verse 25, then to part of Barnabas, then to part of Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he found them, he brought him to Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And I see that it's 1144, and that's not good. That is not good. 
Wow. All right. We're going to... So buckle up, because it's about to get fast. Um, now listen, this is, a, this is a key to the success in a church, because working in a team environment isn't always the easiest. We, we all have, unfortunately, we all have egos, and sometimes egos get in the way. And so this is something we all need to be careful of and strive for unity and not get distracted by our own petty issues. Because when we do, we end up ignoring what is best for the overall church and just doing what we want to do. And that's just not God's design. The church is about the body. It's not about you. It's not about me. But so many people want to make it about them. And the church isn't doing what I want it to do, and so then I'm going to become disgruntled, and I'm going to cause problems or whatever, and that is just so unbiblical. And this leads us to the summary characteristic of the right people for the church, and it's those who are selfless, those who don't need to be named, those who are willing to spend time and walk in the Spirit, spend time with the Lord so they can discern, those who are willing to work in a team that are good, to, to others and, and, and in the church. And it's just people that are selfish or willing or selfless. They're willing to die to their flesh and live unto God. And listen, when we have a church full of selfless people, we won't have enough space for everybody. Because selfless Christians know what's important. And that brings us to the second key ingredient needed to biblically build a church, and that's the right purpose. See, there are a lot of ways you can build a church. So you can go after people through entertainment. You can go after them through skilled musicians. You can go after them with hip pastors. We fail on that one miserably, at, l- at least from the lead pastor perspective. I won't speak for the other guys. But the biblical way to go after people, and what we see with this model church in Antioch, was that they made the word of God the center and the focus. And we see three aspects. Again, we've got to move through this quickly. But we see three aspects of the word of God being central to the purpose through three different people. And it starts with those unnamed founders. And the Bible says that what, what were they doing? They were preaching the Lord Jesus. That's what they were doing. And people were getting saved. And when people were getting saved, they needed to be discipled. And they needed to be trained. So Barnabas and Saul show up and taught much people. Again, Paul had been given some new revelation that this church needed to know. And they took a year. And they're laying it all out for them. And it wasn't everyone, because some people only want to hear preaching. They don't really care about learning the doctrine for themselves. But at least it was much people. But there was another guy that we haven't even got to yet, and his name was Agabus. And what Agabus was did was, was that he gave a warning. Look at verse 27. And these days came prophets from Jerusalem and Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, as signified by the Spirit that there should come a great dearth throughout all the world, or a famine, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Right? And so what we see with these three aspects of the Word of God being central to building a church is that there is preaching, there is teaching, and there is warning. There is preaching, there is teaching, and that is warning. And warning is important. Now, warning comes through preaching. Warning comes through teaching. Warning comes through discipleship. But warning is an important aspect, and it's a biblical aspect I'm going to show you, but because it provides urgency. Warning is what provides urgency that we need, especially in these last days. And what we see is that these three aspects of the Word of God being central to building a church is that this is what brings maturity in believers. This is what makes true disciples, which is the right purpose. It's the only purpose we have, to make disciples. And we see this aspect of making disciples explained in Colossians 1.28. Paul says, whom we, speaking of Jesus, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Right there, we see all three aspects of a Bible-centric ministry, preaching, warning, and teaching. And what? What does that do? That enables the church to bring about perfection in their members. And that perfection is not sinless perfection, it's spiritual maturity. It's making disciples. 
It's the purpose of the church. You see the same thing in 2 Peter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Okay, what does the scripture, what's the Bible, a Bible-centric ministry do? What's it provide? Well, it provides doctrine. That's teaching. That is literally what the word means. The reproof and the correction are warning. Because there's an urgency. So you don't have time to live your life for yourself. And we need to tell you that. And we need to warn you that there's a coming judgment. And if you don't get right with the Lord, you'll suffer loss or you'll spend eternity in hell. We owe it to you to warn you of the truth of what God's word says. But then we need to be able to live it out. That is the instruction in righteousness. That is the application that is taking God's word and breaking it down exegetically, verse by verse, and telling you how this applies to your life when we do that in preaching. So there you see teaching, you see warning, and you see preaching. And this is what makes a a balanced, Bible-centric ministry that keeps us focused. And why do we do that? That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works, becomes spiritually mature, and is able to minister to others in the way that they have been ministered to. And when that is going on, a church is making disciples. And the one mission it has been given, they are fulfilling That is the right and only purpose why we are here. And listen, there are churches out there doing a lot of really good things and fun things, but not doing the one thing that God asks of us to make disciples, to fulfill the Great Commission. That's the one thing we've been given to do. And so if we don't do that, we are failures. Let's not fail. And we know that this was happening here in Antioch because that's what the people were called. Acts eleven twenty six. 26. And when he had found him, speaking of Saul, Barnabas, Barnabas found Saul. He brought him into Antioch and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And obviously these were not Jesus' original disciples. These were the people getting saved in Antioch and assembling and being trained and being taught and sitting under the teaching and preaching of Paul and, and Saul and Barnabas. And it gave them a purpose. And the purpose was mission-driven, and they were mission-minded. And that is how you build a biblical church. And then you embrace that culture. And listen, we can and should have fun together. And we're going to have fun together playing pickleball. And we can enjoy each other's fellowship and each other's company. But those aspects cannot define our church experience. Those are a means to an end. Those are so that we can make disciples, that we can bring people in, they can hear the gospel and be saved, and we can train them up. We have to stay focused on what it is. We can never lose sight the mission that God's given us. And as long as we keep the word of God the center, we won't. And so there's a lot of churches that are preaching and even warning people of hell, but they're not discipling, they're not teaching They're not training people up. And then there's a lot of churches that are teaching, but they're not preaching, which means they're they're not warning and they're filling people with head knowledge and they're learning a lot of good stuff, but they're not doing the mission. And some churches are preaching and teaching, but they're not warning. And so there's no sense of urgency. And so people just take it in and they don't go out with it. So there's a mission that we have. It's as clear as can be. Don't make up your own. Follow what God's word says and embrace it. Embrace that culture of of, of who you are as a Christian. And don't be satisfied with just having babies, but then we want to grow them up in the spiritual nurture and admonition of the Lord to the point that they are disciples and Christians. They are followers and little Christ. That's what the word Christian means. 
the first time we see anyone called Christian here in Acts 11, 26. It's the first mention of the word in the Bible. It's actually only used three times. We use it all the time. That word's only used three times in the Bible here in Acts 11, 26, Acts 26, 28, and then 1 Peter 4, 16. It was a derogatory term. It's a derogatory term coined by the, the pagan citizens of Antioch. You little Christ. You imitators of Christ. But the disciples embraced it. And they owned it. And they loved it. Because it fit their purpose so well. But the real question is, does it fit ours? Because most of us in here would claim to be a Christian. The term today is by and large synonymous with just being born again. Accepting Christ's substitutional sacrifice for our sin. Now, culturally, it's way more diluted than that. And there are plenty of quote-unquote Christian denominations that have a much different view of salvation than what the Bible explains. So there are many people who claim to be a Christian and even think they are a Christian, but they are not. And I just hope that that's not you. And I want to warn you if it is, because culture sometimes gets into the church. And a Christian is a little Christ. So whether you are a Christian or not, that's between you and God. But the best evidence is that you reflect Christ by definition of the term. And of course, not perfectly, but hopefully in some way. Because if not, you should probably apply 2 Corinthians 13, 5 and examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. But listen. If you truly are a Christian and you have accepted that substitutional sacrifice of Jesus Christ, then wear the name well. Don't bring it shame. Because that is a name that many people have died for to preserve its purity. And there are too many people that call themselves Christian and they call themselves that flippantly. Do not view it that way. View it as the purpose of your life to be like Christ and to be, bring others into a relationship where they are like Christ. So if you are a Christian and you wear the name of Christ, wear it well. Deserve it or don't claim it. Make your life about the right purpose. And that's what the church needs. And it gives us a, a summary characteristic of the right people for a church who have the right purpose. And it's those who are single-minded. It's those who are single-minded. On the, on the mission. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, and we need stability in our lives, we need stability in our family, we need stability in our churches. So don't have your mind in the church and in the world at the same time. Don't have your mind in the church and on yourself at the same time. But if you get that right, you're going to get the third one right. Because the, the third one is, that the church needs is, is the right perspective. And this gets to what we were just talking about. How do you view the world how do you view what you have? How do you view what's important with respect to your investment in eternity or, or lack thereof? Because what we see at the end of this chapter is the church at Antioch was given an opportunity to help others in need. So Agabus prophesied there's going to be a coming famine. And then look at the response, verse 29. And the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it unto the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And I, and I want you to just think about that for a second, because here Gentiles are showing their love to the Jews who for so long had hated them. It's a beautiful picture of love here. But they understood the importance of this foundation that they were building upon. Paul talked about the Romans, Romans 15, verse 25. But now I go into Jerusalem to minister unto the saints, for I please them in Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are in Jerusalem. And I please them verily, and their debtors they are, for if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. Paul said, man, it's, it's our duty. It's, we, we owe a debt to the foundation of the Jews. And the Antioch disciples lived that. And that's having the right perspective. And this is a spiritual perspective on life. One that at its heart is generous and giving. And this applies in so many other ways. It doesn't just apply to money. The Bible says they, they sent according to their ability. Every man maximized his gift. Every man gave, and that means according to the potential he had, according to how God had gifted them. And so this is all about a heart attitude and a perspective on what's important. And if eternity is worth investing in or not, that's a decision you have to make. Jesus told you it is, for whatever that's worth. In Matthew 6, verses 19 and 20, and he told us how to do it. 
And they were to lay up treasures in heaven and not on this earth. And, and, and the one thing that will last is living for the Lord. It's doing his work. It's fulfilling the mission. It's being about the right purpose. The truth is nothing else is worth doing, and we spend so much time doing so many other things. And, and the way God set it up, it's even to do it, is for our benefit. Jesus said, Acts 20, 35, I showed you all things, how that's so, how that's so laboring, you ought to support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it's more blessed to give than to receive. So do you believe that? That's what Jesus said. Do you believe it, that it's more blessed to give to receive? Do you believe that God has been good to you? To the point that you should give back to him whenever he asks? Again, I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about everything. I'm talking about your life way before your money. Money is a symptom. If God has your life, the money takes care of itself. But do you believe it's a blessing to give to him of yourself? Because really, that should be the primary motive of all of our giving, of God's grace and God's goodness to us and the ability, the privilege to give back. So I put this on your outline sheet. If God's done nothing for you, then for goodness sake, don't give him a dime. Do not give him a second of your time. But if he has, if he's done anything for you, then pour it out according to the measure that you've received, according to your ability. It's always an argument of Scripture. In the New Testament, giving is never legislated upon us. It's not laid on us as a duty to give in order to gain entrance to heaven or acceptance with God. It's given to us rather as a privilege that we can partake of to express the gratitude of our hearts for the goodness that God has shown us. And that is the right perspective. And that brings us to the summary characteristic of of the right people for a church who have the right purpose and the right perspective, and that is they are sacrificial. And they're willing to sacrifice for the church, for the cause of Christ, because they have the ability to see life from a different perspective than others. And they see the eternal value of giving to something that's so much bigger than them and so much bigger than what this world has to offer. And again, in in ways more than money, it's time, talent, treasure, and more. So let me ask you a question. Do you have something in your life that you're not willing to give to the Lord? And that's a hard question, I know. But the calling of a Christian is to give all of ourselves as a living sacrifice for his glory. And that is what will build a church. The right people, the right purpose, with the right perspective. Those who are selfless, those who are single-minded and sacrificial. And short of that being who we are, then we'll just putter along. And we'll hold services and do what we do. But if we can get these things right, we can build something real and lasting, and something that's worth being a part of. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. And we're going to close out in a song of worship, and then, and then, and then we have, we're going to uh, bring in some new members, so we have a little bit left. I apologize for, for going over a little bit this morning. That, that won't take long, but I'm going to pray, but I just want you to challenge you to, to, to do whatever you need to do with the Lord. You know, we'll be taking up our offering during that time, but if you need to to get right with the Lord. If you need to come forward and get right with the Lord, you do it. You know, don't, don't miss it. And if you don't know the Lord, meet him today. If you need someone to talk to, come, come. I'll be down here in the front row. Come talk to me. We, we'll show you out of the Bible how it means to become a Christian. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for your word and, and, and all that you show us in it and the truth that it is for, for our life and, and for our benefit. And you give us uh, all of these instructions and warning and all of that, Lord. Just so that we can not be ashamed at the judgment seat of Christ and so that, so that we, can, we can be rejoice and, and, and receive reward. And, and Lord, you don't have to do that, but in your goodness you do. And, and so thank you for that. And So make us a people that, that, are, that are right before you, that are focused on the right things and have the right perspective of life. And, and thank you for all that you're doing in our midst. Thank you for for all the right people that we have, and there's so many that are here today, and we're so thankful for it. Just continue to build us uh, for your glory, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go ahead.